So I've been using the Apple Magic Keyboard with Touch ID for almost three years now. And so in this video, I'll be giving my take on this keyboard to see how it's aged after three years, along with whether or not it's worth purchasing in 2024. Now, for those who want an upfront conclusion, if I could go back and repeat my purchase decision, surprisingly, I don't think I would actually go for the Magic Keyboard. Let me explain why. Okay, so touching quickly on design and build quality, the Magic Keyboard currently comes in two colours, white and black. Now with the white one, you can purchase that either with or without a numeric keypad. And for each one of those options, you can also choose whether or not you want Touch ID. And then for the space black option, you get the numeric keypad and Touch ID included. And there's no option to not include any of those. So I'll quickly showcase all of the variations that you can get right now. And there'll also be links somewhere in the description where you can pick them up. Personally, I went with the white option without the numeric keypad and with Touch ID. And I think that the white keys do a really good job of masking all of these sweat marks, which inevitably will accumulate after years of using this, especially compared to Space Gray. And on top of that, the keypad is equipped with these rubber feet on the bottom to help prevent the keyboard sliding across or scratching your desk. Really, I guess my one pet peeve with the keys is the fact that there is no backlighting to them, which I personally would have appreciated an option for. That said, in typical Apple fashion, the Magic Keyboard is constructing using aluminium, which has held up pretty well for the most part. Um, I only have a few scratches, which you can only really notice if you squint close enough. I mean, realistically, this is a keyboard. It's not like you're going to be dropping this thing around every day. Although, because of how compact and light this thing is, it's extremely easy to toss into a backpack and carry around. But really, I guess the main design benefit you get with this keyboard is the fact that it has this slanted wedge shape design that kind of resembles the old MacBook Airs instead of it being completely flat, which in theory should allow for a more comfortable typing experience. And so let's talk about the typing experience because realistically, this is probably what you are going to care the most about in a keyboard. You know, it doesn't really matter if the design is nice and there's an Apple logo on the bottom if the typing experience sucks. And in theory, you would expect the typing experience on this Magic Keyboard to be identical to every other Magic Keyboard variant that Apple sells, you know, in their MacBooks, in their iPads. However, I have noticed that the keys on this standalone Magic Keyboard have noticeably less key travel than the MacBooks and the iPad, to the point where I often do begin to feel a lot of pain and fatigue in my wrists when typing for extended durations of time. Now, if all you're doing is typing a quick email or typing things into Safari, that's fine. This does the job just well. And the typing experience is nice and pretty quiet as well. So you won't have to worry about disturbing anyone else around you. However, the moment you begin to dabble into more extended writing, like writing an essay in Apple Pages or taking lecture notes using Notion, after about five minutes, my fingers usually do begin to quickly fatigue. And I often have to open up the lid on my MacBook just so I can continue typing. So if you are somebody who has a history of repetitive strain injury or any other form of hand fatigue from typing, I would probably steer away from the Apple Magic Keyboard if I were you. Really the only positive thing that I can say about the typing experience is the fact that there isn't any lag or Bluetooth issues when typing, but realistically that shouldn't come as a surprise at this price point. And so based on this, you might question why a rational consumer would ever go out and buy the Magic Keyboard when the typing experience, at least in my non-expert opinion, isn't that great. And I think the main reason is for this Touch ID button that you get here at the top. Now, you do have to pay an additional $50 premium to get the keyboard with Touch ID, but once you have it, it essentially enables you to do things like unlock your Mac or automatically fill in passwords or use Apple Pay directly from your keyboard without having to access your MacBook's built-in Touch ID sensor. So let's say you work a lot in clamshell mode connected to an external monitor like I have in my setup here. Or let's say you owned a Mac Mini instead, which doesn't come with a built-in keyboard. In theory, you would no longer have to worry about entering in your passwords constantly throughout the day. Now, the one caveat here is that this feature only works with Apple Silicon Macs, which have the M series chip inside of them. So if you're running an older Intel MacBook, then unfortunately this won't work for you and the Touch ID button will be pretty useless. And on top of that, the Touch ID sensor also doesn't work on any of Apple's iPads, 
even the M series ones. And if I'm being honest, I don't think the inclusion of the Touch ID sensor on the Magic Keyboard has been a massive game changer for me. And that's for two main reasons. So firstly, I already own an Apple Watch, which can automatically unlock my Mac. And secondly, even if I didn't have the Apple Watch, I often find that it's usually just quicker for me to type in my password because the Touch ID sensor often glitches whenever I try to unlock my Mac and I'll get one of those annoying messages saying that I have to enter my password in order to be able to use Touch ID, which kind of defeats the purpose of having it. Another thing which really annoys me about the Apple Magic Keyboard is its lack of syncing with other Apple devices. So essentially the way you have to set up the Magic Keyboard is Apple give you this nicely braided lightning to USB-C cable, which you use to connect directly to your Mac. And yes, even though the iPhone 15s now have all switched to USB-C, the Magic Keyboard is still being sold with a lightning cable, which I cannot fathom. Now, thankfully the charging isn't much of an issue since the battery on the Magic Keyboard tends to last for around six months in my experience before it needs charging. And it takes like two or three hours to charge from zero to 100%. However, the main issue I have had is that you can only assign this keyboard to one device at a time. So let's say I have a MacBook and an iPad. I can only connect the Apple Magic Keyboard to either the MacBook or the iPad, but not both at the same time. And so if the keyboard was connected to my iPad and then I wanted to quickly connect it to my Mac, I would have to first go into the settings app of my iPad and then manually disconnect it there through Bluetooth and forget the device and then head into the system settings on my Mac and go into Bluetooth there and then pair the Magic Keyboard manually again. And then if I want to switch back to the iPad, I have to repeat the same process, but in reverse order. And it's like from the company that is supposed to be the masters of ecosystem integration and seamless handovers. It's honestly quite surprising that the Magic Keyboard can't do this, especially when there are other keyboards like the Logitech MX Keys that can quickly pair with multiple devices at cheaper price points. So to answer the original question, is this Magic Keyboard worth purchasing? And I'd say no, it's probably not. Even if you are ridiculously rich and you have a ton of money to splurge, I still wouldn't recommend buying the Magic Keyboard. And I'd instead look for something from another brand like Logitech, simply because the typing experience on this keyboard is in my opinion, not that great. And you don't get any of the ecosystem syncing benefits that Apple products are typically known for. Really the only reason why you should consider getting this thing is if you plan to make frequent use of the Touch ID sensor and you don't already own an Apple Watch. Otherwise, again, this feature is not really that useful and it is somewhat redundant. But hey, this is all just one guy's opinion. And if you agree or disagree with my take, then let me know in the comments down below because I'd love to hear from you. And as always, if you found this video helpful, consider leaving a like to support the channel. And over the next week, I'll also be doing a review of the Apple Magic Mouse. So if you'd like to be the first to see that review when it comes out, then hit the subscribe button. And I'll see you guys in the next one.